This is an introduction to English grammar part 10, non-finite verb phrases. My name is Karen and this is for a course given at the University of Utah. Our topics for this presentation include non-finite verb phrases and dangling participles. Non-finite verb phrases. Finite is a grammar term that is used to describe events that take place at a definite moment. Okay. Non-finite verbal phrases do not have a specific time, even though they are made from verbs. Here's an example. John went to the store. That's something that happens at a specific point in time. We can choose that time on a clock. A non-finite verb phrase is something like having finished his homework. Uh, we don't know exactly when or at what point that happened. Okay? Um, and then John took a nap. John took a nap in this is the finite verb phrase because it does happen at a specific time. Okay, participial phrases do not have a subject, so they borrow a subject from the rest of the discourse. So here's an example. Smelling the poison, the princess refused to eat her soup. Smelling the poison is the non-finite verb, fr verb phrase, um, but it doesn't have a subject with it, and so it borrows the subject from the princess, meaning that the princess is supposed to be distributed to both things. So it was the princess who was smelling the poison, and it was the princess who refused to eat her soup. Okay, let's look at some examples. So walking down the street, Josh saw a squirrel. So the non-finite verb phrases in these next few slides will all be in yellow. Okay, the finite ones will just be in black. Um, here, walking down the street, again, we don't have a verb, excuse me, we don't have a subject, and so it must borrow the subject from the next phrase, Josh. Okay, so Josh was both walking down the street and Josh saw a squirrel. Here's another example. Coming home, Beth drove over a skunk. Um, coming home doesn't seem to have a specific point in time, so it's considered our non-finite verb phrase. Insulted by his remark, Mary left the room. Honored by his presence, Julie was introducing Luke to everyone at the party. Again, these don't have a subject, and so they borrow the subject from the next phrase over. To attend graduate school, a student needs to have good grades. To be loved, you need to love others. Okay. Uh, participles. Um, we have seen some information about participles in our textbook. Uh, the past participle ends with the ed, like insulted by his remark. The present participle is, has the ing, the ing form. So insulted by his remark, we would call the past participle, but it's also a non-finite verb phrase. Uh, the present participle we call um, also a non-finite verb phrase here, but it ends with the ing. Okay, we have the infinitive non-finite verb phrase as well that looks something like this. To feel happy, a person does not need a lot of money. Okay, we need to keep track of this part about borrowing the subject from the rest of the sentence. Okay, usually it's located right there close to the non-finite verb phrase. Um, it's important for us because it follows a prescriptive rule um, that if we violate, and we actually violate it a lot in speech and in writing as native speakers, um, then we're breaking one of those prescriptive English grammar rules. Okay, so look at, um, look at these sentences here. These are from your textbook. Uh, one, two, three, and four. You can go ahead and figure out which is the finite verb phrase, the one that has the point in time, and which one is the non-finite verb phrase. Um, you can pause the video if you want. The next slide has the answers on it. So here are our answers for those verb phrases. Um, in yellow, again, we have the, the non-finite verb phrases. Okay, notice that we have both um, past participles and present participles located in those non-finite verb phrases. The ing tells me it's a present participle, and the ed tells me that it's a past participle. Let's talk a little bit about dangling participles. Um, in fact, this is one you might come back to as you look at your information and take your tests because dangling participles are something we get confused on a lot in this class. Okay, prescriptive rules say that it's bad for a non-finite verb phrase to have a subject other than the subject of the sentence. Okay, um, the real rule is slightly more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's a good way to define it. 
So here is an example of our non-finite verb phrase, okay, our present participle, running through the park. Um, the full sentence, running through the park, the statue was very beautiful to me. Um, for some of you, your mental grammar might uh, take a pause for just a moment while you try to determine whether or not the statue was the thing that was running through the park or whether I was running through the park, the speaker. Okay, And this is why we feel like it's a violation for us to have these dangling participles or participles where the subject, okay, the statue is the subject of the next sentence, doesn't seem to match running through the park. Okay, here's a prescriptively okay example. As I was running through the park, I noticed the beautiful statue. Uh, this is okay because it has a subject assigned to both the non-finite part, running through the park, and it has a subject assigned to the to the second phrase of the sentence, the finite phrase. Okay, back to our prescriptively bad sentence, uh, running through the park, the statue was very beautiful to me. Um, this is supposed to be prescriptively incorrect because as a, as a listener, we could get confused about what thing was running through the park. Okay, so a non-finite phrase that doesn't get its subject from the rest of the sentence is called a dangling participle. Native speakers produce these a lot, um, and in common usage we produce them, and people generally understand what they mean because we can get the meaning from the rest of the sentence. Um, that's because there's only one possible meaning for the subject in the discourse. Okay, um, now if you heard the sentence and you thought you pictured the statue running through the park, um, then sometimes we can create humor by using dangling participles. Okay, so in our example, running through the park, the statue is beautifully beautiful to me. So although prescriptivists say that this is a dangling modifier, the meaning is easy to understand because statues don't usually run through the park. The hearer probably won't be confused that the speaker was the person doing the running. Okay. However, the rule against dangling participles is one prescriptive rule that most prescriptivists agree on. So when you get to your exam and it's going to ask you some questions about is this prescriptively correct or prescriptively incorrect, anytime we have a, a non-finite verb phrase where the subject do doesn't match in the following finite verb phrase, then we should mark that as prescriptively incorrect. Okay. So here's a little test for you. So which of these non-finite verb phrases are dangling participles? Can you rephrase the sentence so they don't dangle? Okay. So first you have to identify if it is a dangling participle, and second, if it is, then you need to do a rewrite. You can go ahead and pause the video to do this activity. The answers are on the next slide. So if we look at the answers for this, the first one, having written the best poem, the prize was given to Elaine, uh, this one is dangling because the prize did not do the writing of the best poem. It was Elaine. Okay? We could rewrite it to say something like, having written the best poem, Elaine was given a prize. Uh, number two, being a sloppy writer, Ian's notes were hard to read. Um, uh, Ian's notes are the subject of the second phrase, and that is not the same as what or what or who was being a sloppy writer, so it's also dangling. Number three, realizing that he had insulted her, Jeff apologized to Carol. Okay, um, This makes it sound like Jeff realized that he had insulted her. Oh, sorry, that's correct, and that's why it says not dangling. So in this, we have the subject of both phrases as being the same. Okay, and number four, expecting the worst, my grades surprised, my parents. Okay, so um, this would be like if my grades were expecting the worst instead of my parents expecting the worst. So it would be changed to be something like expecting the worst, my parents were surprised by my grades. That would be prescriptively correct. So the finite verb phrases take place at a specific point in time. Non-finite verb phrases do not... I'm sorry, that's a typo. Do not have a specific time assigned to it. Um, and we need to always make sure that the subject agrees with the non-finite phrase if there's a subject missing. If we don't make sure that the subject agrees, then we have a dangling participle, which prescriptivists say is not okay.